welcome to Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. In our lecture today, we will discuss the fourth dogma, the fourth divine, uh, de defined uh, doctrine regarding Our Lady. This also through an infallible ex cathedra statement regarding her assumption. And before we get into the assumption, I want to give a context of the interconnectedness of dogma in general, but also of Marian dogma. Sometimes some could say, well, some dogmas are less important than other dogmas, a certain hierarchy of truth, and that can be maintained as long as we don't maintain that some dogmas are dispensable because they're lower than, for example, the primacy dogmas regarding the nature of Jesus Christ, the hypostatic union, or the nature of the Trinity. Because to disregard a dogma is to do an offense to the interconnectedness of all dogma. So, for example, the assumption, as we'll discuss today, is essentially linked to the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is deeply associated with the Incarnation and Jesus getting his immaculate human nature from a woman with an immaculate human nature. And of course, the Incarnation is essential for the redemption of humanity. And so, think of dogma as the great mosaic, and if you pull on one thread, if you try to remove one dogma, eventually uh, you will disconnect to all the essential dogmas because that's the beauty of the mosaic, which we call the depositum fide, uh, the, the, the deposit of faith. So while you can talk about a certain hierarchy of truth, that should never lead to a denial of a dogma, let alone doctrine, of course, because this is all part of God's full and beautiful and salvific revelation to humanity as safeguarded by the magisterium of the church. And that includes the extraordinary magisterium, right? An ex cathedra, infallible statement like we'll discuss today, or also an ecumenical council, uh, a definition that comes out of ecumenical council. Trent is the obvious example, uh, which was a dogma producing council in light of all the objections that came forward from the Protestant Reformation, uh, which are then confirmed by the Holy Father. So let's get into the fourth Marian dogma, the dogma of Our Lady's Assumption. This brings us to November 1st, 1950, and Pope Pius XII, once again, making an ex cathedra infallible statement. This is how the statement reads. You have the typical opening for a dogma. We, we pronounce, declare, and define it to be a divinely revealed dogma or truth. So, once again, you can be clear that if the Holy Father is seeking, if the Pope is seeking to make an ex cathedra dogma, uh, it will be clear. He will specify that. And then the substance of the dogma, quote, The Immaculate Mother of God, the ever-Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. Now, Pope Pius XII will offer five references that support this definition. Now, that's different from five sources of revelation, right? We've discussed that already in our, in our first lectures uh, about how the Second Vatican Council in De Verbum talks about one twinfold source, one source with two aspects or facets, tradition and scripture. So we're not talking about five sources, but five references, not sources of revelation, but references that would support this definition. And those five would be number one, the consensus of the church, both the hierarchy and manifestation of consensus even from the faithful. Number two, its presence in sacred scripture. Number two, it's, uh, number three, its presence in sacred tradition. Number four, its presence in sacred liturgy. And number five, precisely our opening point, the interconnectedness between the assumption 
and other Marian dogmas. So let's go through uh, those categories. Let's start with the unanimous consensus of the church. Let's go to 1946. In 1946, Pius XII sent out a questionnaire, if you will, to the bishops of the world. And there were fundamentally two questions that were sent in this document called uh, De Pare Virginis. First of all, first question, could the doctrine of the Assumption be defined as an article of faith? So the first question is, can it be done? Second question is a question of appropriateness or, or opportuneness, we would say. Second question is, do you and your flock, remember this is Pope to the bishops, right? Do, do you and your flocks desire such a definition? Well, regarding the first question, you have 1,232 bishops who receive this two-part question from Pius XII. Out of the 1,232, 1,210 answer yes to both questions. Regarding the first question, uh, only uh, six doubted that it could be defined. And this would make sense because, of course, it is already a doctrine. Re remember, doctrines must be found, founded, supported in Scripture. They must be articulated by the papal magisterium. Even if they're not a dogma, they're already a, a part of the deposit of faith. They're already part of the ordinary magisterial teachings which Lumen Gentium 25 says, we are all bound to offer a religious ascent of mind and heart, of intellect and will to the manifest mind of the Pope, even when he's not speaking infallibly. So the fact that it is already a doctrine presupposes it is in scripture and tradition. It is in the, the twinfold source. So it's odd even that six would doubt a doctrine could be defined. Uh, some 16 bishops question whether it was the right time to do such. But still, 1,210 out of 1,232 bishops is an astounding consensus within the hierarchy of the church in 1946, in the time coming up to 1950. Now, another manifestation of consensus were the millions of petitions received by the faithful. Now, we discussed this briefly with the Immaculate Conception, but the Church has a great respect in, in what it refers to as the census fidelium. And what is the census fidelium? This is the common consensus of the people of God. And the popes have always historically had a great respect for listening to the Holy Spirit as it's manifest in the faithful. Now, let's be very clear. This is not a type of democratic power play of numbers and quantity. This is when the, the faithful throughout the world, so it can't be just from one section of the world, it can't be just from the West or just from the East, but when the faithful throughout the world are confirming to the Holy Father something that is, in fact, of the Spirit. So there's always been a wonderful relationship between the Holy Fathers, the Popes, and the people of God. History shows that at times there have been difficulties uh, with bishops in, in the sense that, going back to the Arian heresy, over two-thirds of bishops, because, of course, of the, imperial, the, the inappropriate political entry of the emperor, uh, two-thirds of the bishops were Arian. Um, around the beginning of the 20th century, you had the modernist heresy, which called for clergy and seminaries to have to take an oath against this heresy, which essentially said that doctrine or dogma could develop out of itself, that it could essentially change, which of course it cannot. But the faithful have always been with the Holy Father. So the Holy Father has a special ear to a universality of the response of the faithful. Now, 
During the time from 1849 to 1950, over 8 million petitions were sent in from the faithful in support of this definition. And it's interesting that both Pope Pius IX, in reference to the Immaculate Conception dogma, in the actual document in the Fabulous Deus, and Pope Pius XII in this doctrine, in, in, excuse me, in this document, uh, which is called Munificentissimus Deus, the munificent, the generous God. In both documents, the popes thank the people for the manifestation of their devotion and their, their testimony to the truth of, respectively, the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption. So, the 8 million petitions over 95 years, from 1849 to 1950, manifest this census fidelium according to the Holy Father and, again, Pius XII thanked the people for their petitions. Now, let's get to the scriptural foundations of this dogma. Uh, the scriptural foundations, first and foremost, go back to Genesis 3.15. And as Pius XII explains in the document, Mary shared in the absolute and the identical victory of Jesus over Satan and his seed. This is the parallel of enmity that we talked about when we talked about the Immaculate Conception. So, as much as our Lord, the, the future seed of victory, Jesus, was in opposition to the seed, so is Mary. Mary shares in the identical, absolute victory of her seed son, if you will, over Satan and his seed. But what is the seed of the serpent? Where St. Paul will tell us, for example, in Romans 5, chapters 5 through 8, 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 14, 25, Hebrews 2, it's, it's really ubiquitous throughout the writings of St. Paul, that the seed of Satan brings forth two ill fruits. Number one, sin. Number two, death. Pius XII then reasons that Mary, having that parallel enmity with Jesus and the same victory over Satan and sin, Mary would triumph over both sin and death. She triumphs over sin through her immaculate conception. She triumphs over death, meaning a bodily corruption ending her life through the assumption. Now, we'll talk more about the topic of death in regards to Our Lady, but what's very clear is because of her Immaculate Conception, she could not experience the effects of sin, and one of those, of course, is the corruption of the body leading to death. So, that's a foundational text for the Assumption. We then go to Luke 128. The hail full of grace, the kekeratomini, the, uh, the one who has been perfected, transformed in grace as an action completed in the past. The full of grace would once again not experience the effects of sin, including death through corruption. Now other texts which are more secondary but, but, but uh, wonderfully supportive of the assumption. Let's go first to Psalm 132, verse 8. Psalm 132, verse 8 says, Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you and the ark which you have sanctified. And even though different translations will emphasize uh, uh, those, the nature of the sanctifi sanctification uh, differently, the heart of the text is clearly the ascension of Jesus, and that the, uh, he, he's going to bring, if you will, and we'll talk about causality in, in just a few moments, he's going to bring with him the ark of salvation. Arise, O Lord, into, the rest, into your resting place, you and the ark of your salvation. And that ark, as we'll talk about in uh, Revelations 11, 19, is of course a reference to Our Lady. Now, also, a, an interesting though mysterious text 
comes up when we go to Matthew 27, 52. Matthew 27, 52 makes a reference to the bodies that, uh, that rise at the time of the crucifixion. It's, it's an unusual text, but it does make reference to a biblical reality of the possibility of a resurrection of the body. The text states, again, Matthew 27, 52, quote, And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints that had slept rose. Now, there has to be limitations in understanding what this means, but it does leave open clearly the possibility of a bodily assumption, a bodily resurrection. Let's go to Revelations eleven nineteen. In Revelations eleven nineteen, we find the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. As we talked about previously, the Ark of the Covenant is ultimately Mary. She becomes the new Ark of the Covenant because she bears within herself Jesus, who's the fulfillment of what was contained in the first, in the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant. She's the living, breathing, immaculate Ark of the Covenant. So many of the fathers of the church saw the fact that St. John in Revelations 11, 19 sees Mary uh, sees the ark in heaven, that that also implies Mary's assumption, her, her entrance from earthly life into heaven. And this is, of course, uh, of course confirmed with Revelations 12.1, which is the woman clothed with the sun. As we've discussed previously, Revelations 11.19 flows right into Revelations 12.1. The ark is the woman. So these are the implicit scriptural seeds for the assumption. And recall, my friends, as we've said before, a truth does not need to be explicitly in Scripture to be A, a authentic revelation of God, and B, becoming a dogma of the church. This was, again, our first major lecture. Uh, scripture is not the only source of revelation. It's Scripture tradition as authoritative, uh, authoritatively interpreted by the magisterium. And we said once again, every Marian dogma and doctrine is at least implicitly contained in Scripture. And these are the implicit references of Our Lady's Assumption. Let's go thirdly now to sacred tradition. And we'll see a gradual unfolding. Remember, you know, Newman makes reference to the acorn becoming the oak tree. The acorn is the initial revelation, the seed, the doctrinal seed. The oak tree becomes uh, symbolic of the dogma, which is later pronounced, and, and that goes through a process of growth. Or, as uh, we talked about earlier, uh, these truths being in the womb of the church, and then they're, they're birthed into a, a, a solemn definition as the Holy Spirit makes progress in time. So, we have in the 4th and 5th centuries what were called transitus accounts, brief references to Our Lady's departing from this life. That will then lead to a statement uh, in 598, and I want to read this to you by St. Gregory of Tours. This is 6th century. Gregory tells us, quote, The Lord commanded the holy body of Mary after death to be born on a cloud to paradise, where, reunited to its soul and exalting with the elect, it enjoys the everlasting bliss of eternity. Now we're going to see, when we get to our next category, that by the 6th century, there's already liturgies dedicated to Our Lady's Assumption under the form of what is called the Dormition. Uh, these are Eastern liturgies. Uh, dormitio means sleep, but in the Eastern tradition you're talking about uh, the separation of Mary's soul from body, and in that sense, death, but clearly without any bodily corruption. So, at this time, there's already liturgical evidence of not only belief, but the celebration liturgically. And we have to always recall that, that wonderful phrase, uh, the maxim of liturgy, lex orandi, lex credendi, in a, in a more <laughs> paraphrased translation, as we pray, so we believe. Not, not simply 
You know, the law of prayer is the law of belief. But as we pray, so we believe. So the fact that it's in liturgy manifests uh, truth as understood and celebrated by the church, and in this case, the early church. In terms of direct references from sacred tradition, we have St. Andrew of Crete, we have St. John Damascene, we have St. Germain of Constantinople, all in the 8th century, who give strong uh, uh, professions and defenses uh, of Our Lady's Assumption. As we move more to the West, we will find that by the uh, 8th century, we will have Mary's Assumption celebrated in Rome, and also 7th to 8th century, Our Lady's Assumption is celebrated uh, and taught in Gaul, present-day France. So you can see this is a very early first millennium development of both accepting doctrine and having it liturgically uh, celebrated uh, by the faithful. Going back to liturgy again, I also want to emphasize that you had in Egypt and Syria celebrations of Mary's Assumption or Dormition from the 6th century. Now, keep in mind, before a local church is going to celebrate liturgically something, it has to have years of belief in the doctrine itself. And that's why it would be appropriate to say, this is part of the apostolic deposit of faith that is gradually more and more specified, more and more articulated as it progresses in the first 500 years of the church. But clearly, if you're having liturgical celebrations by the, by the sixth century, uh, in, in two rather separate parts of the East, this has to be part of what indeed was believed by the early Christians. Well, by the 13th century, there is a unanimity, both in East and West, to the truth of Our Lady's Assumption. Now, there's a, a fifth category that Pius XII uses in defending his appropriate definition of the Assumption, and that is the interconnectedness of the Assumption with other Marian dogmas. In specific, let's focus on the two that are indeed focused upon in the document. Number one, the connection between the Assumption and Mary's first dogma as Mother of God. Uh, you will have an argument of fittingness or appropriateness by Pius XII. He will say, it is appropriate that Jesus would spare his mother from the corruption of the grave. That if he had the power to do so, he would indeed do so. So even though it's an argument more of, a, of an appropriateness or a fittingness, Pius XII is making the connection between the Theotokos, the mother of God, dogma, and the assumption, and how indeed the assumption would logically, appropriately, fittingly flow from the dogma of the mother of God. Far more essential is the connection between, and this is the second dogma that Pius XII will mention, between the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. And I want to read to you from the Papal Bull uh, Pius XII's explanation of this key connection, this essential link between the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. He says, quote, by an entirely unique privilege, she completely overcame sin through her Immaculate Conception. Therefore, she was not subject to that law of remaining in the corruption of the grave, nor did she have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. So, we see here, in short form, that Pius XII is saying, that the Assumption is the natural effect of the Immaculate Conception. Once again, death by corruption of the body is an effect of original sin. Mary could not experience that. Nor, as he said, would she have to wait till the end of time to have 
her body assumed. So let's immediately now examine the causality issue. How is the ascension of Jesus different from the assumption of Our Lady? Jesus ascends by his own power because he is indeed God the Son, made man. Mary's assumption is passive on Our Lady's part. She does not assume herself. Jesus assumes his mother. God is the cause of Mary's uh, assumption at the end of her earthly life into heaven. And so with that, we have to now at least examine in general the question of Mary's death. So our question, did Mary die? Well, let's go back to 1948 through 1950. At that time, there were two, in general, categories of theologians. The first were called the mortalists. And the mortalists maintain that at the end of Mary's earthly life, she had a temporary separation of soul from body. Most would hold in perfect imitation of Jesus, she would agree to have a, a separation of soul and body for three days, which would indicate and, and reflect the time between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, the three days uh, of Jesus' death before his bodily resurrection in the, uh, in, in the ultimate uh, ascension. Now, the other category, and we're going to get back to the mortalists in just a second, but the other category are the immortalists. The immortalists maintain that Mary did not have a separation of soul and body at the end of her earthly life, but at the appointed time, she was simply brought body and soul into heaven. Now, there are other secondary uh, versions of both mortalists and immortalists, but these are the, the general categories. What does Pius XII definitively state about the death of Mary in Munificentissimus Deus? The answer is nothing. He does not include it as part of the definition. Why? Because, number one, it's not essential to the definition itself. The definition is establishing that at the end of her earthly life, Mary was brought body and soul into heavenly glory. That's the dogma. It does not need uh, a defining constituency of a defining element which includes whether she died or not. What must be maintained, whether one is an immortalist or a mortalist, and that remains an open question till today, one must maintain that Mary did not die of a bodily corruption. So let's go back to the mortalist theory for just a moment. The mortalists hold that, again, in, in, in various small T traditions, uh, that at the end of Mary's earthly life, God gave her a choice. And this is also somewhat confirmed in the consensus of mystical tradition. And once again, when we talk about mystical tradition, we're talking about the private revelations of the saints, uh, the victims, the mystics. Putting those all together, one can get a type of mystical tradition consensus. It is not divine revelation per se. It's, it, it's not part of public revelation. But on these issues which public revelation does not determine, it is fair to examine that uh, because if there's a choice in any case, one can opt towards the mystical tradition. Well, the mystical tradition does depict a, a concept of Our Lady uh, for three days having what appears to be a separation of soul and body. Now, that cannot be because of heart disease or cancer or anything else. It would be at the end of her earthly life a separation in imitation of Jesus if indeed the mystical tradition is correct. But what every Catholic must hold is that Mary did not die through bodily corruption. So these two positions remain open. Uh, the stronger tradition appears to be uh, the death of Mary. St. John Paul II in one Wednesday audience talked about the Eastern tradition of the Dormition, 
uh, which makes reference to the death of Mary. At the same time, others have said, even within the mortalist tradition, well, she did experience these three days, and, and that's why, for example, in Jerusalem, there is the Church of the Dormition of Mary. There's also the Tomb of Mary uh, uh, near the, the Garden of Olives. While for these three days her body was exposed, but some would even argue, well, it was only the higher part of her soul, known in biblical anthropology as the spirit of her soul, that was taken up and then the rest was taken later. Uh, in any case, the general sense is that indeed Mary, at the end of her earthly life, uh, experienced some supernatural hand of Jesus, some, some supernatural dimension by which she is brought body and soul into heavenly glory. And that's, of course, the heart of the dogma. Now, in, in closing, we could say, well, that's fine about Our Lady, but what does that say to the Church? Well, the Catechism beautifully articulates that Mary's assumption is the eschatological sign of hope for the Church. Now, what does that mean? It means that Mary's assumption, that this great victory after a sinless life of, say, 60 years or so, again, we talked about that estimate, which is only speculation, but for her earthly life to live entirely full of grace, to be entirely disposed to the will of God, to in no sense sin, even venially, as the Catechism of the Council of Trent tells us, that that's a sign of hope for you and for me. Not that we would expect a, an immediate assumption of our bodies at death, but that there would be the final resurrection of the body on the last day. So Mary's victory is an encouragement, it's a joyful anticipation of our ultimate resurrection of the body when Jesus comes in the final judgment, in the final uh, end of human existence on earth. So every truth about Our Lady is beautifully applied to the church as is this truth as well. Well, thank you for being with us for this lecture of Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Mirvali saying once again, God bless you all and let us recall the words of Jesus and try to live by them as generously as we can to behold our mother. God bless you.